Glory to God. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. And Matthew chapter 8, we've been talking the last couple of weeks and looking at different situations and healing in Matthew chapter 8. And we looked at the leopard, and we found out that the leopard, many times people will look at, and look at the leopard, and they thought, well, some people have actually said, well, Jesus healed the leopard because he wanted to prove that he had this power. But really, as we look at the Scriptures, and that's how we... That's how we measure things, not by people's opinions or how they see it, uh, but we measure it by according to how it's written and what it says, that actually the leopard is the one that initiated the healing, and we know that he had faith to believe that Jesus could heal him, but he didn't know if he would heal him, and he answered that question forever, not only then, but now today, because Jesus is the same. Everybody say, Jesus is the same yesterday. What's the next word? Today and what, church? And forever. So Jesus doesn't change, even though we're reading him what he did years gone by. He hasn't changed. The will of God hasn't changed. The plan and the purpose is still the same. But I want us to go back real quickly. If you go back to Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, and this is where we stopped last week, and we found out that Jesus, because of their unbelief, and he marveled at their unbelief. That's not a compliment, by the way, when he marvels at your unbelief. It's almost like I can't believe you people have no faith in you. But he marveled at their unbelief, and it actually hindered him from doing what God wanted to do uh, in their lives because of their unbelief. Now, you have to remember this. Write this scripture down. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 tells us, and this is not the only one that's found in Galatians and Habakkuk, and we find out that the scripture tells us God tells his people, his children, how he wants us to live and he tells us he wants us, Romans 1.17 says, now the just, the just means what? Those who have been justified by the blood of Jesus, that declared righteous, the word uh, justified means you have been declared innocent. Well, if you're the righteousness of God, you've been declared innocent. And so we're the just. It said, now the just shall live. Everybody say, God said, the just, that's me, shall live by faith. So how does God want us to live every day? Come on, everybody say it. God wants me to live by faith every day. We could put it this way because we know how do we get faith to come to us? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by what, church? By hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we could say God wants us to live by His Word and believe what His Word says and not our feelings, not our emotions, not our past experiences. I mean, certainly you can learn things from your past experiences, but, you know, you have to remember this. You don't want to be living by your ability. You want to be living by His ability. That's called the grace of God. But notice it said that He couldn't do any mighty miracles because of their unbelief. Now, if this happened then, then some of the reasons, not all of them, but we know that people might not get healed today because of their unbelief. They may want to get healed, but they don't believe that he'll heal them. They may be like the leopard. Well, I know, Lord, you can heal me, but will you heal me? And this example is the first individual account we find in the book of Matthew that settled the record straight for you and I that Jesus will heal me. Everybody say, Jesus will heal me. Say it again, Jesus will heal me. Point to somebody and say, Jesus will heal you. Now let's bring it to where we're at today. If we were living in that day, we'd say, Jesus will heal you. And that's true. But now we're 2,000 years later. And we found out from the Word. Remember, He hasn't died on the cross up to this point, has He? The stripes weren't laid on His back yet. Right? Hasn't paid for our sins. Hasn't paid for our sickness and disease hasn't paid for our peace yet, hasn't redeemed us from the curse of the law yet. He came as a man. In other words, he had no special favors. He had to be anointed with the same Holy Ghost. Read Romans chapter 8. It says we have the same Holy Ghost that Jesus had. Isn't that amazing? Glory to God. Think of the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. I'm quoting Scripture now. Dwells in you. You got the same Holy Ghost. So, you know, uh, you might put it this way. You may, might feel like you're checking out, but I'm telling you what, the Holy Ghost loves raising people up. Hallelujah. So, once again, we have to understand that if faith was a requirement then, 
Faith is a requirement that for you and I also because how does God want us to live, church? Come on, everybody say it, by faith. Say it again. God wants me to live by faith. Say it one more time. God wants me to live by faith. If you don't remember that, then you're going to, tomorrow morning you're going to wake up, you're going to have feelings. Your body's going to start talking to you. It's going to tell you, oh, my. Oh, uh, let's just take it easy today. Let's just not do anything. Oh, my, your back hurts. Oh, my, your knee hurts. Oh, my, you know, your ear hurts. I mean, he, there's a lot of these things going to come out. And you're going to have to make a decision as soon as your eyes pop open. You're either going to make a decision, you're going to live by what God says, or you're going to live by your feelings. Now, you have to understand, you can't get God's best if you're not living in His best. And so when He tells us, hey, I want you to be, you know, a lot of people, you know, they bash the faith message, which I kind of like, I'm like, well, let me see now. You bash the faith message, but if you preach the Word, faith comes to you. So what are you saying, not preach the Word? No, we need to get the Word out. Everybody say amen. Because people don't like it. Because, see, really, it's the devil that doesn't like it. That's the devil behind that because he knows that if you get in faith on a subject, you're going to receive from God. Say it again. I'll receive from God when I live by faith. All right. Now, notice, and certainly God, he has, he, God there's certainly the sovereignty of God, but the older we live, like, for instance, now that I'm in my 60s, I don't live the same way when I go to my house as when I did when I was three years old. When I was three years old, my mother still cooked meals for me. You don't expect the three-year-old to do that. But as you grow up in the things of God, God expects you to become more, event, more independent. And I think we as adults, you know, we say, adults, what does that mean? Well, we're capable of making sound judgments, and we're capable of doing things on our own. And God expects us to grow up so we can get things on our own. Everybody say amen. How many of you like it when you get things on you? like it when you, I don't have to wait for somebody. I'm not dependent on them. I don't have, think about the Old Testament. Many, many times if you needed to get healed, you had to go to the prophet. If you needed to get a word from God, you got to go to the prophet or the priest. But for you and I, all of that's built right in here because I got the greater one on the inside. But notice, Mark the sixth chapter. And notice, let's go to verse 5. Notice Mark chapter 6, let's go to verse 4. And Jesus is talking to them, and of course, he's once again, in verse 2, he's teaching them in his own country, because teaching is what you have to do to get past the unbelief. Unbelief means you, have, means you haven't made a decision to where you believe the Word of God over your circumstance or over your situation. And so in verse 4, Mark, Mark chapter 6, everybody got it? Mark chapter 6, verse 4, he said, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. In other words, they weren't receiving him. They weren't honoring him. They weren't recognizing him. Right now, apparently, he was operating in the prophet's ministry. He actually operated in all five, what we call all five-fold ministry gifts. He operated in the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. He was all five of them. Think of it this way. When Jesus was on earth, he was the entire body of Christ. No person could get into that place yet because he hadn't paid for our sins and he wasn't rose from the dead. After that, when people became born again, everybody say born again, now he started adding people to his body and he's the head of the church. So, But he's it, so he's got everything. That's why the Scripture tells us that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. We could put it this way. He had all of the fullness and the measure and the anointing that the entire body of Christ now has dispersed out upon it. Now, don't let that think, wow, I mean, that, that's hardly nothing. Oh, listen, the power of God and the Word of God is more than enough to take care of any situation that you ever need. And if you need a miracle, you can believe God for it. God, God's arm has not been shortened because now it's been dispersed out. You read there's been tremendous men and women that have been endowed by God because of their faithfulness, and that's what we have to do is keep pushing in and keep growing into things. And he said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin or his family and in his own house. Verse 5, so obviously it's his own town, his own kin, own family. He certainly wanted to show them this anointing, this power, but it wouldn't be released. And he said, 
and he could there do no mighty works. Notice he couldn't do them. Everybody say he couldn't. It didn't say he didn't want to. It said he couldn't. Something was hindering him. Let's learn by these things. When God puts these stories in, we want to learn by it so we don't make that mistake. He said, and he there could do no mighty work, save that he laid, the word save here means except that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. If you study that out, that means that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk that had minor ailments. In other words, there was no miraculous miracles taking place. God wanted to. Jesus wanted to. Which, how many of you have had the thought at least once in your Christianity that Jesus walked around and if he wanted you healed, he'd walk up to you and touch you and you were healed? I thought that before. And then you begin to grow and you begin to learn that that's not true. Their faith, now there were times where the sovereignty of God would walk up. The man at the pool of Bethesda, uh, we find that where the five porches were laid out, he walked up to the man who had been there 38 years. How many of you remember the story? You know, and Jesus, and the Scripture tells us Jesus knew that he had been there a long time. 38 years is a long time to be there. And God, by his own compassion, would send an angel down in a season. They would move the waters, and the first one in, everybody say the first one in. The first one in, no matter what was wrong with them, they were healed. No matter if it was a man, a woman, if they were old, if they were young, if it was terminal, if it was something minor, the first one in the water, they got healed. He said, I have no man to take me on my way there. So he was making an effort, but we don't see really any faith on his part. But we do see God can, and he does, and we've seen it before, and we've probably experienced it, that God will just do something for us, not because we were in faith, just because he loves us. But remember, how does God want us to live, church? Come on, everybody say, he wants us to live by faith. So you don't want to be laying around the pool when you need a healing when you could get your healing anytime you need it. There's a lot of Christians living like that. Well, if God wants me healed, that he'll come and heal me. No, he wants you healed. He wants you well. And then sometimes people don't want to be well. That's another equation. There was a person that came to Jesus, and he asked him what he wanted. I believe it was the blind, blind Bartimaeus. I thought, man, Lord, why would you ask a blind man what he wanted? Well, how many of you know, apparently, whatever this man's faith was believing God for, he could have got, maybe he didn't want to be healed of blindness. And also, that man at the pool of Bethesda, found in John chapter 5, you find that Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? Isn't that an amazing question? You know, there are people today that don't want to be healed. There are people that don't want to be well. Now, if you got any sense about you, everybody say, I got some sense about me. I want to be healed and well. I found out sickness and disease is not fun. It'll rob your joy in a hurry. Now, notice verse, verse 4. Of his own kin and his own country, and there he could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now notice verse 6 tells us why he couldn't, why he couldn't. Didn't, he wanted to, but he couldn't. And he marveled because of their what church? Unbelief. Everybody say unbelief. In other words, they didn't believe that he was anointed to heal. Write the scripture down, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, 17 and 18. Jesus said that he was anointed to heal and to preach the word. If they didn't believe that, then they didn't receive anything from him. That's not his fault. That's their fault. The same with us today. A born-again Christian can love God, can go to church all the time, can take notes, can never miss a service, can always be there and not walk and get what they want. Why? Well, I just don't know if he wants me healed and well. Well, we can go right back to share with people the leopard Jesus said, I will. Everybody say, he will. And now for you and I, he already has. We look back, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes, we, everybody say, we were, what church? We were healed. Everybody say, we were healed. 
And so he said in verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. So what do you do when you have unbelief? If people don't believe the Word of God, well, we know faith comes by hearing. So they need to keep hearing the Word and hearing the Word and hearing the Word. So if they keep hearing it and they're teachable and their ears are open to hear it, then what happens? Then faith will begin to come to them and they'll go from unbelief to faith. That's the good part. Now, go back to, if you would, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Let's begin looking tonight at the centurion's faith. The centurion's faith. And remember, the leopard, he initiated this healing. Jesus didn't go to him. He came to Jesus. Now we find the centurion, and I like this part, the centurion's faith. Everybody say, the centurion's faith. Now, the centurion was a Roman soldier. And I'm sure if you took a vote in those days, most of the Jews probably did not think very highly of the Roman soldiers. But notice this one particular Roman soldier, and he, and I want you to go all the way down, if you would, please. Let me see. I want you to go down to verse 10. We're going to skip down here ahead. But I want you to see this centurion, he, not just his faith, but the Bible says, the Scripture says, that he had a specific kind of faith. And his faith was called great faith. And I like that because it's good to have faith because the Bible says to live by faith, but then you can have great faith. Anybody want to have great faith? I mean, it's good to have faith, isn't it? That's a good place to be, but once again, if you can upgrade and you can have great faith, anybody want to have great faith? Then that, I want to find out, okay, if this man had great faith, what did he do or what did he say or understand about Jesus that other people didn't because we just read Back here in Mark chapter 6, that there were people that didn't believe Jesus was anointed to heal. Now listen, if you don't believe Jesus is your healer, then it's not that he, he can't heal you, but you're hindering him from being your healer. It's like being a Savior. If you don't believe Jesus is the way to heaven and you don't accept him, you don't get to go to heaven. No different. What is your faith? You know, Jesus talked in another incident. He said, according to your faith. Everybody say, according to my faith. He said, according to my faith or your faith, be it unto you. In other words, whatever you believe... That's what you'll receive. If you believe nothing, your harvest is going to be what, church? Nothing, absolutely. Now, notice, let's go to verse 5, and we're going to read down through this kind of fast because I actually want to go over to Luke's account because Luke's account is similar, but he gives us a different view of this healing that took place. And he said in verse 5, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5, Matthew 8, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, where is he at, church? Capernaum, absolutely, remember that. There came unto him a centurion beseeching him. The word beseeching means to beg or to prompt or really trying to get his attention. And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come, and what church? Everybody say, Jesus will come, and healing. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak. If you're going to underline something in your Bible, you want to underline these next five words. But speak the word only. Speak the word only. Remember that. Underline that, because we want to find out what is it that this man did or said or believed that gave him great faith. Because listen, if this man, a Roman soldier, can have great faith, you can have great faith. And I believe that ought to be the mark for all of us to have great faith. And he said, he said, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. Say that with me. Speak the word only. Now, where is Jesus right now in heaven? He is at the right hand of the Father. You go over and you study the book of Hebrews, you'll find out that there, one of the things he's doing is he's there interceding for us, isn't he? Right now. So if you ever think nobody's praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. Can't get anybody here better than that. Everybody say amen. I mean, if anybody knows how to get prayers answered, it's Jesus. 
After all, he's the one that's taught us and taught the disciples in the Word how to pray. So notice, I want you to notice something very interesting. Let's read on here because we're talking about this man had great faith. But he said, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. Underline the word authority. 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 It's interesting that he would bring that up. This man has made an observation about Jesus. Now, you can't find it in this account, but in Luke's account, you'll find out that he knew some things about Jesus when he showed up. And he brought up the word authority. Everybody say authority. Everybody say it again, authority. Now, I want you, if you can, let me see. Are you still there, Matthew? Yeah, you're still there, Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to notice something that people observed and Matthew wrote down by the Holy Ghost to be written about Jesus. We know this Russian soldier was a higher-ranking official. He had authority, and there was somebody over him that had authority, and there were people underneath him that submitted to him. Notice what they observed about Jesus and his teaching and preaching. Matthew chapter 7, are you there? Verse 28, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his what? At his doctrine or his teaching. Now, they were just blown away by his teaching. Like, wow, wow. Now, notice one of the things that they observed about Jesus. Verse 25, For he taught them as one having what church? Authority. Everybody say authority. Did they recognize he had authority? Did they know he had authority? Yeah, they did. They recognized it. They, they just seen it from his teaching. Wait a minute. This guy has got some authority. Actually, Jesus, when he was resurrected from the dead, Matthew 28, 18, you might want to look and do a little study on it. When he arose from the dead, he said, all power and all authority has been given unto me. Who's got the power? Jesus does. Who's got the authority? Jesus does. He's got it all. Well, if he's got it all, then what's the problem? The problem is the devil has still running around deceiving people. He makes them believe or they believe that he has the authority, that the devil's still in control, and that the devil has authority. And don't, don't misunderstand me. He still has a right to be here. Not forever. He is the God of this world system. His time is running out. He has a legal right to be here. But you as a believer, everybody say, me as a believer. You as a believer, you have authority over him now because Jesus gave us the authority. He delegated it to us. Old, time, Old Testament Scripture says that we're the head and not what? The church. Or we're the head and not the tail. We're uh, above and what? Now, now listen, if God said that for his servants in Israel, think how much he says that for his sons and daughters. No. You're the authority. Everybody say, I've got the authority. The authority didn't come from you. It came from him. He gave it to us. We know one of the authorities that we can use all the time is the name of Jesus, right? Philippians chapter 2, what does that say? That Philippians chapter 2 says that name has authority. It's above everything that has a name in heaven, on earth, and things below the earth. There's our authority just in the name of Jesus. We have authority also because we're sons and daughters of God. Say it with me. I have the power. And I have the authority. It's not because of me. It's because of him. And he delegated it to us. He gave it to us. So notice in verse 29, and he taught them as one have an authority and not as the scribes. Very interesting. Now let's go back over here, Matthew chapter 8. And so we see something about, and this man says, I'm a man under authority. 
This soldier recognized Jesus having authority. That's why he brought the subject up of authority. No doubt, and when we go over to Luke's account, you're going to find out Luke said when he heard of Jesus. Well, what did he hear about Jesus? Apparently, he heard Jesus could heal any sick person. Jesus was casting out devils. Jesus was raising people from the dead. Jesus would speak to storms and they would cease. This soldier knew that Jesus was an authority over all those things. He knew, actually, if you look that word up, it means supreme master. Jesus was supreme master and he still is today. And now he wants you and I to be the same way. Everybody say amen. We're supposed to be reflective of him. So this is why this man saw, him, I, I'm a, I have some authority. I have some authority, he said, but he, it doesn't say this, but you can tell this way. He said, but I know you've got some authority. And I know that if I can get you to just speak a word and tell this sickness and disease to go, my servant will live. I know you have authority over that. By the way, church, by the name of Jesus, you have authority over sickness and disease. You have authority over devils and demons. Come on, church. You don't have to let the enemy harass you. Use the name of Jesus. Now, you're going to have to stand your ground. Everybody say, stand your ground. Because, see, if the enemy has had some success, you know, uh, in your life, maybe through deception or just laziness or whatever, you know, and you've just always cowed in and gave in, or maybe you didn't know that you had that power and authority, he's just not going to go, oh, well, now that you know that. No, he's going to fight you for that ground. But guess what? He has to leave. Everybody say, he has to leave. Remember, James says, if you'll resist the devil, he will what, church? He will flee. You have to keep keeping, holding fast your confession, keeping your shield of faith up, keep speaking the Word of God. Everybody say, keep speaking the Word of God. And listen, how are we to live, church? Come on, everybody say, we're to live by faith. So even if we sit and we feel like nothing happens, you know, we still got, you know, weird feelings about us, what are we going to do? We're going to keep saying the Word, keep speaking the Word of God. I like this. One of my favorite scriptures in Jeremiah said, thy word is like a hammer to a rock. What's the hammer to a rock? The rock keeps pounding, or the hammer keeps pounding at the rock, pounding at the rock, pounding at the rock. Every time I speak the word of God, I'm speaking to the mountain. I'm speaking to the mountain. It might not move for three days. Nothing might change for three weeks. But you hold fast. Hebrews tells us your confession of faith, and what happens? You get the reward. Everybody say, I get the reward. Look to your neighbor and go, I get the reward. Keep speaking the Word of God. Now, notice, here's the man, and we're learning some things because we have to learn about authority, and we have to believe that God's Word is the final authority in our lives. As long as we're still looking for other avenues, as long as we're still not making that Word a number one priority in our lives, then we haven't recognized the authority as the final say in our life. And then it's going to be hard for us to walk and live by faith because I'm not trusting the Word and I'm not believing the Word. Now, you just can't, uh, it's going to sound like I'm regressing, but it sounds like, well, man, I just need to, well, listen, just listen, listen to the Holy Ghost, and He'll begin to tell you where you can tighten up your belt, where you can begin to reel in your flesh, things that you've been having problems with, you know, your mind, and he'll begin to tell you, now listen, you need to get better at that. And what happens? You're starting to walk by faith a little longer. You're starting to walk by faith a little longer. You're starting to walk by faith. It's like a little child. When they get up for the first time and stand on their feet, it may be two seconds, but everybody's excited. Why? We know if that baby will still keep getting up, he'll start being adventurous, he'll start taking a step, he might fall, and that's kind of where our faith is. But once again, we're building our faith and exercising our faith. Everybody say, building our faith and exercising our faith. Look today and go, build your faith and exercise your faith. And so as we do that, what happens? Is that baby's muscles start to get a little stronger. They start to get the balance underneath them. Two or three months down the road, what are they doing? Now they're walking. And might not be real gracious, but they're walking. Three months ago, they weren't. That's the way with your faith. You're walking. You may have some errors. You may have some boo-boos. You may go back and get in the flesh, repent, go back and pick it up again. Don't quit. 
Everybody say, don't quit. You know, one of the great things about Proverbs talks about a righteous man always gets up. God will be there to pick you up if you don't quit. But if you quit, there's not much he can do for you because he's not going to override your will. Well, everybody put yourself and say, I'm not a quitter. I'm not quitting on God. I'm not quitting on the Word. I'm not quitting on Jesus. I'm not quitting on the Holy Ghost. I'm not quitting on you. I'm just not a quitter. God put the Holy Ghost in you. He's a greater one. He's not a quitter. Trust me, he has worked with a lot of people with a whole lot more wrong with them than you and I. So don't think, well, you don't understand, brother. I'm, my light bulb's not very bright, and my knife's not very sharp. Trust me, God can use anybody. If you read the story, and I've told you several times years ago, Bass, read a book by Smith Wigglesworth and read his biography. You'll find out the man had a fifth or sixth grade education, but he was used tremendously by God, preached in other countries, Tremendous miracles happen, and he raised people from the dead. See, it's not about your ability. It's about your availability. And then you walking by faith. Say it again. I'm going to live by faith. Now, notice the great faith. Now, I want to know about this great faith. So this man knew authority. He looked at Jesus, and he knew Jesus was an authority over sickness and disease. He said, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say... To this man go, and he goes. See, he's understanding authority. See, when Jesus would tell sickness to go, what did it do, church? It went. This man is saying, I understand your authority. Now, the sad part is this should have came from a Jew. These were God's chosen people. But it's coming from a Roman soldier. You know, you can go to church. You can take notes. You can read your Bible. You can have perfect attendance. But there's still one thing you're going to always have to do. You're always going to have to be doers of the Word and believe the Word for yourself. The person beside you might not want to believe it. They may shout louder than you. But if you believe it, you get the results and they don't. Say it with me. I have to be a doer of the Word. This man believed Jesus had the authority. He knew it and he said, hey, I know how this thing works. If I tell one of my guys underneath me, go, they go. There's no debating that. If I tell them to come over here and do this, they come over here and do this. He said, I've watched you. I've seen you. You have authority. Well, Jesus did, and he still does, and now his authority is in the body of Christ, you and I. And he said, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he did what, church? Everybody, verse 10? Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. How many of you are verse 10? All right. What happened? He said to them, he said, he marveled. Everybody say, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. In other words, all of Israel, this man had the greatest faith he has found. Glory to God. That tells me something. Anybody can have great faith if they'll just believe the Word of God and act on it. Let's read on. And I say unto you that many shall come to me from the east and west and shall, and, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out. He's talking about uh, those who, uh, Israel, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. Now notice, go thy way as thou hast, what church? Believe. Was this centurion soldier in faith? Yes, he was. As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed that selfsame hour. Now, I want you to go to Luke chapter 7. And I want you to see Luke's account. I know I read through that a little bit fast, but sort of couple little road journeys there, but I wanted you to see something because Matthew's account implies the centurion went to Jesus. Once again, we're talking about great faith. But when you read Luke's account, Luke's account shows us that the centurion did not go to Jesus. The centurion did not even see him. The centurion didn't even talk to him. The centurion actually 
got Jewish leaders, and the centurion told them what to say to ask Jesus, which really makes his faith even greater because he didn't even see Jesus. He didn't even talk to him. He was talking through his servants and relaying messages back. And this man, and here's an indicator of great faith, this man just flat out believed what Jesus was concerning healing. He didn't have him in person come to him. He didn't have gifts of the Spirit in operation. There was no special manifestation. He just knew that Jesus was the authority. He knew Jesus was the healer. And he just had to get Jesus to unleash his authority and tell that sickness and disease to go. And he believed it without ever seeing him or ever hearing him. Are you ready for this? How does that apply to you and I today? Sometimes we're waiting on a special manifestation. We're waiting for a dream. We're waiting for a vision. We're waiting for some special sign. When really, we're supposed to be led by our spirit and by the word of God and not our external. Thank God, nothing wrong with getting hands laid on you. Nothing wrong with anointing with oil. But great faith is not waiting on anybody or anything. It is going out, getting into the Word of God, and saying, I just believe what God says, because God said He can't lie, and His Word is not a truth, but it's the truth, and that's the way it is. That's great faith, church. Now, is the devil going to tempt you? You bet you he is. If he tempted Jesus, he's going to tempt you. The servant is surely not greater than the master. You're going to be tempted. What's he want to do? He wants to get you out of faith where you're standing on the word, and he wants to get you into the feelings and the sense realm. He wants you to believe what you see, what you hear, and what's going on is a greater possibility than what God said about your situation. Say this with me. God cannot lie. Say it again. God cannot lie. Write it down. Do a little Bible search tonight. There's scriptures in the Bible that says God cannot. He cannot lie. So when he speaks, it's the truth. It's not a truth. It's the truth. There's a lot of truths we find out on the earth today, but it's not the supreme truth. Just like when we look out in the natural realm, we think, well, this is all that there is. This is just, you know, this is all we have to look forward to. But the truth of the matter is, this isn't all we have to look forward to. If you go back over to Ecclesiastes, it talks about vanity and vanity. I remember that all is vanity. Well, that's not true for the child of God. For the child of God, all isn't vanity. All isn't a waste of time. We've got hope on the inside of us. And besides that, think about it this way. The Old Testament was written to people who were spiritually dead. So you can understand why somebody living under the Old Covenant, even though when they died, many of them because of their faithfulness and their servitude to God and following God the best that they could, went into Abraham's bosom, but they were still spiritually dead. They were not born again. Everybody say born again. Remember, they could get their sins remitted. They could get their sins forgiven. How many of you remember that? Animal sacrifices, they would come. They would get their sins remitted. But think about it this way. If all you ever do is get your sins remitted and your sins forgiven, you still don't get into heaven. You want to write this down? Because you are not born again. Remember, Jesus told a religious leader, Nicodemus, he told him twice, John 3, 3 and John 3, 37. John 3, 3 and John 3, 7. He said, you must be born again. Now, the good thing is when you get born again, all of your sins get remitted. But you not only that, you have a new, you're a new creation. Your spirit is now after God. Everybody say amen. You're a new creature. The word creature in the Greek means you're a new creation. Your spirit is a new creation. Now you are in fellowship with God. Under the Old Testament, they could get their sins forgiven, but they still weren't born again. But they couldn't be born again because Jesus hadn't paid the price yet. 
Now, notice here in Matthew, or, sorry, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 1. Now when, he had entered, now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Now, notice, Matthew doesn't say this, but Luke says that he heard about Jesus. But notice in verse 2, And a certain centurion servant, which, by the way, servants in those days could be boys or girls, and many times they were slaves, who was dear unto him and was sick and was ready or literally was about to die. So we could say this servant, this young child, or this young girl was ready to die, but this centurion soldier really had compassion on him. And he said in verse 3, And when he heard of Jesus, everybody say heard of Jesus. Now here's the thought every time I read these things, because it happens more than one time, but go back to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I wonder what the world is hearing today, what they think they're hearing coming from the church today about Jesus. I wonder what they think or what they're hearing from people who go to church today. Are they hearing he's still healing? Are they hearing he's still saving? Are they hearing he'll still forgive you? We, we assume that that's what people are, but how I many know that's not the case with everybody? We should be saying those things because Jesus is the same, but notice he heard, and whatever he heard about Jesus, it sparked enough faith that he knew, i got to get this man to just speak and say, be healed, and my servant's going to be healed. He heard. How does faith come? Come on, everybody say, by hearing. See, we have to be very, very careful when we go out into the public. When we go out into the public, particularly if we're around a bunch of unbelievers, I mean, it's not acceptable anytime, but really when we're around a bunch of unbelievers, we really have to be very, very careful what we say because if they know you go to church and they're listening to you mumbling and grumbling and griping and complaining, what are they going to think about the God you serve? What is going to be the impression about you? They're going to say, well, they're no different than I am. But we are different, but sometimes we don't always reveal that. But what they were hearing that day or those days about Jesus was that Jesus was a healer. Everybody say Jesus was a healer, and his teachings were anointed and powerful. Notice here in Mark chapter 10, we find blind Bartimaeus. Notice what happened to him. When he heard, because blind people can't see, but he heard, and this wasn't the first time he heard, because if you hear somebody's name the first time, that doesn't mean anything to you until you hear something about them, but he had been hearing, apparently, about Jesus and about healing other sick people, other blind people, raising people from the dead, casting out devils, speaking to storms, all those things he had been hearing, and so he thought, man, if this guy comes by my place, I can get healed just by hearing. And it said in verse 46, and it said, And they came to Jericho as it went out by Jericho with his disciples, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he had heard, everybody say, when he had heard. And when he had heard, when he had heard, everybody say, when he had heard. And when he heard that it was who? When he heard that it was Jesus. Did it mean something to him? Oh, it sure did. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to do what, church? Now, prior to that, he was begging. Probably saying something like, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. Probably had a cup or a bowl out there shaking it, alms for the poor. Which, if you read the Scriptures, the Bible talks about giving to the poor, alms to the poor. And notice, but when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, notice, he went from begging to getting Jesus' attention. But he said, and saying, Jesus, thou son of David. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? He knew this man was the Messiah. He knew that he was anointed. Thou son of David. By the way, not everybody knew that. The religious people sure didn't. Thou son of David, have what on me, church? Mercy. Everybody say, mercy on me. I want to ask you this question. Any of you get saved and born again because you deserved it? 
Anybody. We got saved or born again because of the mercy of God. God gave us what He wanted to give us, not what we should have gotten, right? You read the Scriptures and the Epistles, He calls it the mercy of God. Now listen, how am I going to get healed? Do I get healed because I earn it? Or because He wants to give it to me, His mercy? Right? This is why so many Christians think, if I go to church, I read my Bible. I mean, I never miss a service. I'm involved. I just don't understand why I can't get my healing. I just don't understand why. I mean, if anybody deserves it, wait a minute, listen. We've all fallen short of the mark, haven't we? Everybody say all of us. How are we to live? Come on, how are we to live? We're going to keep coming back to it. Everybody say, I'm to live by faith. So how am I going to get my healing? Right, absolutely. Why, did, why, why can I believe that? Because he gave it to me. Remember Psalms 103, verse 2 and 3? Those of you that were here three or four years ago, we found out we preached it for about six months. Went down through that chapter, all those benefits. Benefits. Everybody say benefits. What's the benefits? New Testament calls them inheritance. What have I inherited when I accepted Christ in my life? I inherited forgiveness, right? I inherited healing. Come on, church. It's my benefit or my inheritance. Write the Scripture down, Psalms 103, verse 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Forget not. Guess what happens if you forget Him? Well, if you forget Him, you don't apply Him. And forget not all His benefits. First one, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who forgiveth all thy iniquities or sins, and who does what? Heals. Everybody say, and who heals. Let's go back there. Some of you are looking at me like Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Don't forget them. It's a benefit package. You have an inheritance. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Psalms 103, verse 1. Psalms 103 and verse 1. Everybody got Psalms 103, verse 1. Everybody got it. I hear four of you. How about the rest of you? Say, I got it. Okay, notice. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is what? Within me. Do you, you, sound, do you think David's trying to tell, oh, just praise the Lord. Just praise him. No, he's not talking like that. He's going, well, all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. All his what, church? Benefits. Do you have benefits? Come on, say, I got benefits. Now, apparently, if I forget them, then I'm not going to walk in them. Whose responsibility is to remember them? Huh? Say it, Troy. Whose is it? It's mine. You know, you can forget to repent. Yeah. Yeah. There have been times in my life where I actually forgot to repent. Who had to remember to repent? Who sinned? <laughs> sure. It's my benefit to get forgiveness. But if I don't, if I don't do 1 John 1, 9, then I'm, I don't have forgiveness. That's not good, is it? I don't want to have sin or transgression or iniquity. Those words are all the same thing. It all can be like a, a clot to be, be, be between me and God. But he said, who forgiveth all thine iniquities? There's one of the benefits. I can get all of my sins forgiven. Everybody say, all of my sins. Matter of fact, during the new birth, all of your sins were. Matter of fact, you became a new creature in Christ. Old things, all old things were passed away. Behold, all things became brand new. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? And notice, who healeth? Healeth. Everybody say, God healeth. How many of your diseases? All of my diseases. Everybody say, God heals all of my diseases. Now, go back here to Mark chapter 10, if you would, please. No, go back to Luke, Luke chapter 7 real quickly. Now, notice he heard about Jesus, verse 3. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. Now, notice this is a little different account. Now, the centurion got some elders of the Jews he didn't go to Jesus like Matthew's account is. He went to Jesus through the Jewish rulers 
that he knew about. And these Jewish rulers thought very highly of him because he was doing things for them and helping them to build things. And so they thought and they thought, spoke very highly of this Roman soldier. But he said, and when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. In other words, he got a hold of the Jewish rulers, leaders, and said, hey, guys, would you go get Jesus and tell him to come to this house and heal my servant? You do that for me, I know he'll heal him. Can you hear faith? It's not, we'll check and see if he's going to, or he might, or he will. I know, I know that my servant will be healed. See, that's faith. Now notice verse 4. And when they, talking about the elders of the Jews, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly. I mean, they made a beeline straight to him. See, Matthew's account doesn't tell us that way. Matthew's account implies that the centurion soldier went, but Luke's account says that he did not. He was just operating through those people and talking back and forth with those people, never saw Jesus, never talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. He did all of his talking and conversation through the elders. Why? Because he recognized authority. He said, all I got to do is just say a word and it will happen. And when he came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy. Now, underline this in your Bibles because this is very, very interesting. This is the thinking, and I said it just a little bit ago. But notice what he said, that he noticed they came and they're talking about the centurion soldier. They're telling him about this situation. They're telling him about this servant, this young servant being, you know, on its deathbed, and he wants you to come to heal him. And, and Lord, we, we just want to tell you something about him. This Roman soldier, he's a good soldier to us. He treats us right. He's treated us fair. And listen to this now. Because remember, you don't get saved based on your works. You're not going to get healed based on your works. You're going to get saved by faith and through faith, and you're going to get healed by faith and through faith, because how am I to live? Come on, everybody say it again, by faith. Now notice, here's what the Jewish elders said to Jesus. And they were saying that he was worthy. In other words, this is a good soldier. He treats us nice. Man, he is a really good person. I mean, if anybody, if anybody ought to get healed by you, it ought to be him. You understand we can't have that thinking today in the body of Christ? It's almost like we're trying to earn it. But you can't earn something you can't pay for. Certainly, we need to be involved in the body of Christ. Certainly, we need to put our hand to the plow. Certainly, we need to be diligent. Certainly, we need to be faithful. Certainly, God has a work for everybody. But that's not how we get healed. We get healed by faith because we believe that he's our healer. Remember, he is our healer today. He's not going to be. He's not trying to be. He is my healer. Everybody say amen. Notice, for he was worthy that he was worthy for whom he should do this. In other words, man, Lord, if anybody, if you ought to go and heal that, I mean, he, he's worthy. He's worthy. Everybody say, I'm not worthy. Come on, everybody say, I'm not worthy, but I can still get healed. Aren't you guys not based on your worthiness? Because, see, listen, the devil will always tell you you're not doing enough. Well, yeah, you led five people, Lord, but you should have led six people, Lord. I mean, he'll always tell you it's not good enough. That's just how he is. He wants to make you feel unworthy. Aren't you glad to know that your benefits come not because of you, they come because of Jesus. So it's not based on whether you're worthy or unworthy. If you can believe it, you can receive it. Are you with me, church? Get a hold of this. I know this is going to be new thinking for us, but just, just stay with the Word of God. And so they were saying, man, Lord, if anybody ought to get healed, it ought to be him. Well, once again, this man, this centurion's got some faith. Now, they said, they said he's worthy. Everybody say, the people said, the elders said, he's worthy. But now two, two verses down here, Matthew said it and Luke said it, but when it came to the centurion soldier, he said he's not worthy. Now, isn't that interesting? 
See, so what happens if you're trying to find out if you get healed, whether you're worthy or not? Well, one group says you are, and one group says you're not. Well, you ready for this? Jesus said you qualify, you're worthy because of Jesus. See, he's our mediator. He's the one that stepped in between us and God, bridged the gap, and now we can have these benefits. I don't have to go out and earn it. I can just receive it and believe it. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Now notice, he said, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Oh, he's really helping them. He's not done sound like he's beating them, mistreating them, unjust. He's being fair. He's helping them. He's very nice and kind. And so they're proving their point why, you know, you ought to go, I mean, this guy's earned it. No, you can't earn your healing, but you can receive it by faith. Verse 6. And so here we go. The elders said he was worthy. But verse 6. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house. So here's this group of Jews going with Jesus. Jesus is coming to the house. They're getting close to the house. When they were now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. So he must have looked out his window and saw Jesus coming. He knew he was coming. He didn't even go out. What did he do? He sent friends out. He told the friends what to say to Jesus, why he's not coming out. You have to understand. He probably felt like, well, I'm a Roman soldier, and I know how the Jews, the people of God, think about me. I know what they say about the Roman soldiers. And yet, they've done wrong. They've been mistreated many times. I haven't done that. That's why I tried to be just and be fair and help them to build things for them. But I'm sure I'm low class. And I heard Jesus said he's the king of the Jews. And so I don't even need him to come under my house. I just need him to speak the word only. My servant will be healed. Can you understand that? But once again, do you get healed based on your worthiness? No. Can't get saved on your worthiness, can you? Romans, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not of yourself, but it is a gift of God. Can't earn it. A lot of people think they're right with God, and they'll tell you why they're right with God by all the things that they do, but they're not. Everybody say they're not. You can't earn it, but you can receive it. Hallelujah. The 23rd Psalm, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's talking about right now. He said, for he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. And verse 6, and when Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. This is what his friends were saying to Jesus now. Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, I like that. Matthew says, speak the word only. But here it says, say in a word. Don't need a long sentence, just say in a word. He's probably thinking, just say healed. Bless God, my servant will be healed. That's great faith, church. Never seen him? Can you see that? Never talked to him in person? Had people talking back and forth for him, but he believed what Jesus said. $64,000 question, do we believe what he said? He can't lie. So if he said it, it's got to be real. How many of you are trusting that when you, if, if you die in these physical bodies, you're going to go to heaven? How many of you trust and believe in that? Man, if you're trusting him with your life, I think we could trust him for the benefit. I, I think we could trust him for our inheritance. I, I think God's good and stood but. He's, well, we sing songs all the time about the faithfulness of God, and God is faithful, and God is faithful. He's never lied. He's never quit on us. He never left us. He's never forsaken us. I think we can count on God. Everybody say, we can count on God. Verse 6, or verse 7, Wherefore, neither I thought myself whether to come unto thee, but say in a word, notice, here's faith talking, say in a word, and my servant shall be what, church? shall be healed. Close your Bibles and we'll pick up verse 8 next week. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Anybody want to have great faith? I think God, God wants us all to come to that place. 
But once again, we've got to learn to walk. We've got to learn to live by faith. And learn to trust God and believe God. And as we stretch out and begin to walk, man, then the next thing you know, we begin to run, get excited about the things of God, putting our hand to the plow. Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for the word. Thank you, Father God, that you've told us how to live. You've told us how to walk. And we know that without faith, it's impossible, Father God, to please you. But, Lord, we're determined to be people of faith. Say it with me. I'm determined to be a person of faith that trust in your word, you cannot lie, and everything that your word says is not a lie. So I make a determination right now to believe the word of God, to receive the word of God, and act on the word of God, and I'll begin to grow my faith muscles. I'll begin to exercising being a doer of the word, and thank you, Father, I'll go from crawling, then to standing, then to walking, and then to running. Thank you, Father, for being so long-suffering with us. Thank you, Father God, for giving us the Holy Ghost, teaching us all the truth. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now stand up real quickly. Lord reminded me about something, so that's what we're going to do. Everybody stand up here real quickly. Close your eyes. Put your hands on yourself. Say this with me. Thank you, Lord. Healing is my benefit. Forgiveness is my benefit. But I have to remember them. I have to put them into action by using my faith. If I need forgiveness right now for any sins, any transgressions, any iniquities, any disobedience, I ask you, Father, right now to forgive me. I receive that forgiveness by faith. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord. You said in your word that you would heal and have healed all of my diseases. Thank you, Father. As I lay hands upon myself, I receive healing into my body right now to bring about a healing, a cure, an effect, and a wholeness in this body. Thank you, Father. I receive my healing by faith in Jesus' name. I believe what you said, and I'm going to hold fast to that, and I thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn around and tell somebody, do not forget your benefits. See you Sunday morning.